Hi there and welcome again to this uh, Ukraine update uh, special on explaining history. Uh, and I guess the, the key question that is sort of hanging over everything at the moment is the intentions of China. Uh, I did do something on YouTube about this um, last week, but the situation is so dynamic, so fluid, that um, there, there is no kind of repetition really. The, um, the the art of um, the People's Republic of China, the uh, the Communist Party, um, the the kind of the skill of sending tactical mixed messages is is really quite um, a thing to behold. There are few other governments in the world that really quite master it in in the way uh, that the Communist Party does. The problem uh, in trying to read China's intentions um, is that China has firstly established itself, or attempted to establish itself in its creative ambiguity. This idea that um, it can point eastwards towards, um, the westwards towards Russia, um, and also uh, orientate, orientate itself towards uh, Europe and America. For the past 10 to 15 years, um, the Chinese economy, well, longer than that really, since the, the 1990s, the Chinese economy has been uh, a vehicle for supplying um, the Western world particularly, but much of the rest, with um, cheap manufactured goods. Look around your living room, wherever you are in the world, and you will see something that has been made in China, or perhaps most of the stuff there that has been made in, in China. China has optimised its vast um, manpower resources um, to uh, really to kind of transport itself um, into the, uh, the 21st century. So... A, break, a, a fundamental break with the Western world um, on the question of Russia and Ukraine is a, a difficult thing to conceive of, unless, of course, a new iteration of China um, is one that's emerging, one where China is attempting, as it's attempting to do with its real estate industry at the moment, to kind of wean itself off uh, real estate bubbles, um, that a, a China that's trying to kind of sort of wean itself off a dependence on um, Western markets for manufactured goods. Um, and to um, portray itself and to um, develop itself as a kind of a, um, a, a militarized, aggressive hegemonic power in Asia, the, the kind of the, uh, the uh, Asian hegemon, um, which will inevitably bring it into conflict with um, not just its Asian neighbors, but the United States of America. Uh, Great Britain, India, Australia, um, and uh, Japan. The decision to um, have a flirtation, if you will, uh, have a, a kind of um, some sort of relationship with with Putin, which I'm not sure is quite as strong as as is being suggested. This was based around the idea that Putin would be able to pull off a spectacular victory in the West, in Ukraine, efficiently in a short space of time, uh, and the victory would be so complete and so absolute that there would be no questioning it, no challenging it, and it would shake up the international rules of play. It would shake up uh, the ideas that the international community had about what was currently possible in, in um, the, the, the arena of international relations. It would say to the international community, it's been done once and there's no reason why it can't be done again. The uh, status of Taiwan, which has been protected by Amer American military power since the 1950s, um, and has been viewed as inviolable um, with a rising Chinese militarism, uh, the, so Xi Jinping's thinking goes, this is no longer necessarily the case. 
and a, a shake-up in world affairs like Ukraine, like a resounding blitzkrieg victory there, um, that Putin also hoped would um, be uh, received by the Ukrainian people with immense popularity. Putin uh, appears to have sold himself the idea that a Ukrainian invasion and some kind of pan-Slavist uh, reunification of the, the, the great uh, Slavic kind of family um, would be um, rapturously uh, popular. Uh, and I suspect that this is probably the the vision that was sold to China as well. Um, China would be unlikely to have wanted to have backed uh, the current situation that is set to drag on for a considerable period of time and uh, would have... Um, presented a, a, a united front of both um, China and, and, and Russia's enemies. The, the difficulty at the moment is that the, the plan has not just backfired in Ukraine, but it's black, backfired globally as well. A disunited uh, West, a, um, a Europe in America, such as you find under the, the kind of the era of Trump, um, that where the, the, the divisions between the two become very stark and very um, pronounced uh, over questions of things like NATO spending uh, and defence policy in, in general. This has been very much to the advantage of uh, both Putin and Xi Jinping uh, and a, a united um, Europe and America uh, along with the, the other powers who tend to gravitate in a, a kind of a Euro-American um, sort of orbit uh, in Southeast Asia and in Australia and New Zealand and Canada and uh, places like that. This sort of unification of the, the, the wealthiest parts of the world um, has been a, a, an epic uh, disaster for Putin. Um, we'll probably see various kind of asymmetric uh, warfare, cyber warfare attempts to uh, break up um, that union as, as quickly as possible, or this not so much union, but this kind of solidified um, uh, groupings uh, as quickly as possible. And, of course, um, Putin's uh, admirers and um, the, those uh, European politicians on his payroll from the League of Nord in Italy um, uh, all the way through to various of the far-right um, parties across Europe uh, and the um, various uh, British uh, uh, political figures who have taken uh, oligarchic money, large swathes of the Conservative Party, and obviously the uh, former members of the the, the Brexit Party, uh, such as Nigel Farage, um, uh, who are ardent admirers of uh, Vladimir Putin and have spoken out in uh, in in, in defence of him, are now in a, a bit of a quandary. The tide has gone out on them. Um, there is no sense of uh, a pro-Putin um, public opinion in Great Britain. There never really was, um, but the um, use of organs like Russia Today to polarise and to kind of accentuate uh, any sort of uh, anti-Western discourse um, uh, has been hu hugely effective. Um, the, uh, as uh, Russia Today correspondents have been, have been pretty candid about their um, their role and, and how Russia Today functions, and, and populist figures from um, Farage through to uh, George Galloway and Alex Salmond and people like this in. Um, have been um, fated by Russia today. These would have been people who had uh, had uh, kind of very little reach, very little kind of uh, platform.
um, and very little sort of exposure had it not been there. They're used to uh, uh, Ru uh, Russian uh, essentially psyops in uh, Great Britain and beyond. The um, the difficulty here for the um, the European right, and I and I imagine they will be called into play at some point by Putin uh, when he finds them, um, when he needs them. Uh, the, the, the difficulty is that um, this rather kind of uh, odd, uh, anomalous policy position of um, admiring a, a, a Russian autocrat um, it only really plays well with those members of the base who are so extreme, you know, real kind of fascistic types, who look to um, their own countries, Germany, Britain, France, America, um, and believe that the, the problems of um, what they would think of as being, you know, wokeism and all this, this kind of idiocy... Um, um, the, the, not the, the things that one classifies as woke are idiotic, but the, the concept of woke is, is the idiocy, just to clarify that. Um, that their constant waging of culture wars has led them to the inexorable conclusion that some kind of autocrat in their home countries would be, um, would be preferable. And that's how um, kind of white men of a certain vintage will uh, allow will um, get back uh, into positions of, of, of power of course you know in uh, most of the world white men of a certain vintage have never really been removed from power whatsoever but the ability for them to see themselves as victims of feminism and all this sort of nonsense um, is, is really really quite quite um, uh, quite astounding Anyway, that's the only group for whom these pro-Putin messages make any sort of meaningful sense because they look at the violent repression of gay and lesbian people in Russia, uh, Russia's um, kind of return to brutal patriarchy and the uh, suppression of kind of uh, feminism and uh, laws to um, enshrine, uh, you know, the absolute right of men to do whatever they want in Russia. And this is all, is all rather rather admirable. Um, there's bits that, you know, in Western countries, they have to keep certain parts quiet. Um, but these constitute a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of a standard electorate. And there is going to be very little appetite amongst any political figure or any broadcaster to say anything remotely pro-Russian whatsoever. Uh, and as the atrocities uh, continue in Ukraine and as there are continued threats to expand the conflict, perhaps even to places like Moldova or even Poland or the Baltic states, the... Um, the, the public standing of pro-Russian figures is going to um, come under intense pressure. It all depends often in uh, modern European uh, democracies and the USA um, whether newspaper owners or uh, media billionaires choose to take against uh, one of, uh, you know, uh, one or other right-wing populist. There's, of course, a, you know, huge, huge catalogues of skeletons in closets and all this kind of stuff, money going left, right and centre, and kind of outrageous public pronouncements about Russia having been made. But public memory being what it is, is, is very fleeting, very short, and, and uh, the, the kind of the relentless news cycle means that lots of these things can be missed, ignored, overlooked, and it actually takes uh, a realignment, um, a kind of a, me a media ownership realignment in order for, uh, normally for unpopular politicians and unpopular policies to be held up to the, the wrath of public opinion. 
Will it happen? Well, I don't know. It it, it remains to be seen. Uh, but certainly, newspaper proprietors are very good at sensing the popular mood uh, and deciding uh, which winners to back and, and, and who to dump. There has been a, a remarkably effective um, attempt, a remarkably effective um, level of distancing the British Conservative Party from the vast, vast amounts of public money, of, of Russian money, so a big pun, Russian money that has been I I invested in it. Um, the, the, the tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands of, um, of pounds that have been spent on um, dinners with uh, conservative MPs and ministers, uh, and the um, strange death of the Conservative Friends of Russia uh, group, um, show that there is an, an almighty clean-up job going on uh, at the moment. The only problem, of course, is that for such a long period of time, um, the uh, there have been. Um, influence operations on the Conservative Party and it's been widely seen as a you know Britain's current crop of, of naive and, and greedy um, political chances have um, taken money without really questioning where it's from or who it's from and those that did know um, didn't seem to to care very much but so far, so lucky, uh, the Conservative Party has managed to kind of dodge every bullet, and it has the uh, kind of the chief dodger in charge in the guise of um, Boris Johnson. Um, and, and once again, um, this has been a the the, the war has been uh, a magnificent distraction from his uh, his own um, political crises caused by his decisions to flout lockdown rules and hold parties in number 10 Downing Street. But anyway, I, I, I digress. So we can see within the um, with, within NATO and the European Union um, a state of flux that's sort of coming to, uh, that has been over the last week or two, coming to a, a, a rapid end. The decision by Germany to rearm after nearly 75 years, the, um, the countries like um, Ireland and Sweden even, uh, considering uh, breaking traditional neutrality, um, the um, re-establishment very rapidly of kind of transatlantic relations, which weren't just strained under Trump, it must be said, and uh, successive American presidents uh, became frustrated with Europe's uh, low military spending, and the sense that they were relying on American might in order to, to protect them. So where Great Britain fits into all of this is an interesting question. When Great Britain has placed itself at the um, periphery of, of of not just Europe, but really of kind of international affairs. Great Britain's traditional role from Churchill onwards was to act as the Atlantic Bridge. American presidents would ring British prime ministers to find out what German chancellors were thinking. Um, and now this has been, as a result of Brexit, this has, has, has come to an end. Um, the fantasies of the Brexiteers have been that Britain can become this sort of freewheeling, buccaneering, I've never really understood quite what they mean, but um, um, this buccaneering nation. And I think what they are, uh, these conservative ministers who were raised on things like Macaulay and Trevelyan and all these sort of Whig histories, um, they've got very, very excited by the possibility that uh, Britain could be sort of perfidious Albion once more, um, playing off different European actors uh, to, to manage the balance of power and all this kind of uh, stuff from the, the, the days of Lord Castlereagh. Uh, and it's all nonsense, of course, because there is one European power, it's the European Union, and Brexit, it was hoped, again, in another kind of part of the, the fantasies that we will um, be picking over for many, many years, it was hoped that it would shatter the European Union, and, and so Britain could make a series of bilateral treaties and alliances and play everybody else against, off each other. 
um, but it would appear those days have gone. So um, the result of uh, of Brexit and having a, a Brexit government in the guise of Boris Johnson, who has used Brexit to transform his own brand of conservatism into, uh, or transform conservatism into his own brand of kind of uh, English nationalism, um, which plays very well to the readers of uh, the Daily Telegraph, his uh, former newspaper, and who um, delight in every kind of Europhobic sort of statement and, um, uh, and, and joke almost. One of the th odd things about living in Britain is that it's uh, difficult to um, get away from the fact that people admire Johnson because they think he's funny. And then we wind up in a crisis like the one we are currently in. And uh, the um, all the assumptions of Brexit come tumbling down. The... Uh, U European Union didn't splinter. In fact, it strengthened itself. It now has countries like Ukraine wanting to join, um, and it has become more united than at any time uh, in the last 20 years. You, even uh, rogue members like Hungary have supported some of the measures that the EU have demanded. You know, the existence of um, a large and menacing eastern neighbour has helped to focus the thoughts. And the um, a problem now that Johnson faces, and he no doubt hopes that the British populace are too distracted to, to see, is that he's an isolated figure. Uh, and that uh, far from being the, the Churchillian statesman that he, he fantasises that he is, um, though all British prime ministers, I suspect, to some degree, uh, fantasise about being Winston Churchill, um, he is a, a, a British politician in a position that's kind of unlike any other, any other for several centuries. One who is um, really reduced to being a kind of an irrelevance on the international stage. The British have managed to buy themselves um, a lot of goodwill in Ukraine by supplying some very effective anti-tank shoulder-launched missiles. But that will only go so far. It's not with the people of Ukraine that someone like Boris Johnson wants to appear popular. He wants to be fated in the White House uh, and in the uh, various offices of state around, around the world and wants, as all British Prime Ministers do, to have his own page in, in history. Well, I think he suspects that he will definitely have that and it won't be a particularly flattering one. Um, so... Britain's world power, Britain's sort of diplomatic power particularly, has been massively eroded by Brexit. And it takes a crisis for these assumptions to actually be tested. And it takes a crisis for us to see in the cold light of day what Britain's world power now looks like. And it's entirely possible that this will be um, part of an ongoing trend and uh, a downward one, unless, of course, something radically changes during the course of the crisis, which we can't rule out because, as we've discussed, events are moving so rapidly. Anyway, I'll hope to catch you next week for further discussion of the uh, events in Ukraine and beyond and how the world is being reshaped before our very eyes, perhaps in ways more radical and fundamental even than after the 9-11 attacks. Um, and you can catch me on YouTube and I will be adding some commentary to the Explaining History blog at www.explaininghistory.com Org, um, and we have a Patreon there. It's always, uh, or donations are always gratefully appreciated. Helps me to continue doing this sort of hopefully vaguely useful work. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye bye.